Now, as we, um, as we continue this evening in the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, we are in chapter 3 on God's decree. We have looked at the first four paragraphs, so now we are at the top of page 17, chapter 3, paragraph 5. Chapter 3 is entitled, On God's Decree. And as we have discussed, God's decree is theological language. Um, it's derived from Isaiah 46, verse 10, by the way, um, that God has declared or decreed the end from the beginning, from ancient times things not yet come to pass, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all of my purpose. That kind of language in the Bible that God declared or decreed what would take place in human history is why this confession of faith uses that language. And so God's decree is God's declaration before creation of all that would take place in time and history. In other words, God is the author of history. He does not merely know the future by passively observing it like we would watch a movie and observe what is going on, but God is the one who actually wrote the story. He wrote the script. He is the author of history, not just a mere observer of what takes place in history. And so Scripture teaches that God authored history before creation and that all things are working according to His purpose. It starts generally in paragraph 1 to talk about how all the events of history work together for God's purposes and the good of those who love Him, Romans 8.28. And then it moves on in the following paragraphs to talk about how God's specific purposes are toward saving a people in His Son, Jesus Christ, that is, the church, whom Scripture calls the elect. That language, elect, is a word that simply means those who are chosen, that is, chosen by God. Um, and the word predestined is also used to speak of their eternal destiny. They were predestined to inherit eternal life, to, to go to heaven. And so this word praorizo, uh, predestined, this Greek verb that's translated predestined, it is a word, praorizo, that means to decide the outcome beforehand. So God decided before creation how the events of history would play out, and he ultimately, the Bible says, predestined two things. The crucifixion of the Son of God, we see that in Acts chapter 4, that there were gathered in Jerusalem, uh, Herod, Pontius Pilate, and the Jews and the Roman soldiers to do whatever God's hand and God's plan had predestined to take place, which was the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross to pay for our sins. And then also the Bible uses this word predestined, praorizo in Greek, to speak of how God has, in love, predestined us for adoption as sons, Ephesians 1.5, and some of the other passages uh, that we've been looking at. We see this language is used to speak of God purposing and planning and deciding to save a people through the sacrifice of Christ before He ever created us. He created us knowing that we would sin and already having the plan to save us before he created the heavens and the earth. And of course, this is a difficult doctrine, and uh, this is something that many of us have struggled with, are struggling with, and many Christians throughout history have. And what I want to show you tonight as we finish chapter 3 in paragraphs 5, 6, and 7, is whereas they go on to explain the doctrine of election uh, in chapters 5 and 6, they'll end in chapter 7 with an encouragement to us not to be troubled by this doctrine or to be bogged down by it, but ultimately the purpose of this doctrine of election is that we would be so thankful and that we would give glory and praise to God that He has saved us even though we do not deserve that salvation. So let's look together. Page 17, chapter 3, paragraph 5, we read, those people who are predestined to life were chosen by God before the foundation of the world according to His eternal and unchangeable purpose and the secret counsel and good pleasure of His will. Now you might think, well, where are they getting that language from? From the very verses that are cited below it. We're going to read some of those together. 
but all of these phrases that in the sentence I just read are pulled straight from those verses. You'll see some of this in a moment. He chose them in Christ for eternal glory, purely as a result of His free grace and love, without anything else about them serving as a condition or cause, moving Him to do so. What does that second sentence mean in paragraph 5? Well, what it's saying is, is that God did not choose to save us because we were better than anyone else or because we were um, wiser or somehow morally superior or did anything to merit or deserve or to in any way cause Him to save us. Rather, salvation begins with God's work, not our work. God does not save us because we did something, and then he says, well, because you did that, now I will save you. No, God's salvation is something that he chose to give us without reference to anything that we have done. In fact, in spite of all the sins we have committed, God is willing to save us. And so what it's saying here is God does not save us as a result of what we've done, but purely as a result of his grace and love. Why does God save us from our sins because he loves us because he's gracious because he's good not because I but because of who he is and this is important because all the glory and all the credit for my salvation and your salvation if you are in Christ goes to God and, and not to us we, we can in no way even in part credit ourselves with the fact that we are saved it is purely of grace this is what the word Grace means it is a gift. It is the undeserved, unmerited favor of God. And so we're going to look at some of these verses in a moment after I finish reading these paragraphs. But what they've said there in paragraph 5 is pulled straight out of the New Testament. Continuing to read in paragraph 6, they say, Just as God has appointed the elect to glory, so he has by the eternal and completely free purpose of his will, foreordained all the means. Now this is critical. God did not simply say these are going to be saved and that was all he did. He decided to save these people and then he ordained the means by which they would be saved, which includes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it also includes things like who would share the gospel with you so that you would hear and believe and be saved. God sends people to share the gospel with the lost, right? This is why the apostles are called apostles. That word apostolo in Greek is to be sent. The apostles were literally the ones who were sent by Jesus to preach the gospel. And so when, when we talk about this this language of the means by which God saves, what the authors of the confession are saying here is that, is that God not only is sovereign over salvation, but the means to get us there. He provided every step along the way so that if you were blessed enough to be raised in a Christian home and to attend church even as a child, and that's not all of us, but many of us, that is our testimony, well, then that was the mercy and grace of God that you were brought up in such a home where you were raised in the gospel. And those means of your salvation, whatever they were, even if you didn't hear the gospel until much later in life, whatever the means of your salvation were, they were ordained and appointed by God. God, God has taken care of all that is needed to bring you to faith in Christ. Continuing, the confession says in paragraph 6, Therefore, those who are elected, being fallen and atomed, are redeemed by Christ and effectually called to faith in Christ by His Spirit working at the appropriate time. So, those who are elected, like all men, are fallen and atomed. That is, we've talked about the sin nature before. We're going to get more into that in the confession when it deals with the doctrine of man. We dealt with this when we work through the doctrine of man in the 2000 Baptist faith and message, but we are conceived in sin. We come into this world as rebels against God, hostile to Him and to His law, rebelling against Him. We are fallen in an atom, 
And yet all those who are elected are redeemed by Christ. And they are effectually called to faith in Christ by His Spirit. So they were elected by the Father, redeemed by Christ through His death, burial, and resurrection, and called by His Spirit working at the appropriate time. So you see the Trinitarian work of salvation here. I'm going to point this out in some of the passage that, passages that we'll look at tonight, but they are intentionally using the Trinitarian language of the Father, Son, and Spirit working together to save us. So elected by the Father, redeemed by the work of Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, um, and also His act of obedience that He perfectly kept God's law. And then effectually called by His Spirit. Now, this word of effectual calling, there's a whole chapter on effectual calling later uh, in the confession, but that is that God is able to so work in the heart of a person that He is able to call them to salvation such that when He calls them to salvation, they will come to faith in Christ. This is not God forcing people into the kingdom, but once again, this is the language of being dead and now being alive in Christ, of being born again, of being blind, but now I can see. This is the language of being lost and in darkness and then found by God and now children of the light. So this kind of language is used in Scripture to speak of how when the Holy Spirit calls a person to salvation, He is able to so work in our hearts to bring us to faith in Christ. This is a doctrine we'll look at more uh, in the weeks and months ahead, but they mention it here. Now he uses language here from Romans 8, 29 and 30. They are justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by His power through faith to salvation. Now I dealt with Romans 8, 28 to 30 when we covered this in the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. But Romans 8, 28 says, um, All things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. And then we are told um, that those whom God foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. And those whom He predestined, He called... And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. Romans 8, 28 to 30. Now, you'll notice there are five steps in this, what is often called the chain of redemption. There are five steps that God brings us through all the way to salvation and eternal glory. The first is those whom he foreknew. Well, foreknowledge is a word that means to have a intimate relationship with someone. It does not mean simply to know something is going to happen in the future, but foreknowledge is the language of, a, of a, a, an intimate personal relationship. It's, it's used in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, to speak of the relationship between a husband and his wife. Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore a son. Right? This is... This is the love and the relationship shared between a husband and a wife. Well, this same kind of language is used for how God loves us and desires a, a close relationship with us and those whom He foreknew. So, so in eternity past, before He created the heavens and the earth, God foreknew a people whom He would save. And so He set His love on them, is what that word foreknew means. He loved us even before He made us. So those whom He foreknew... He predestined. That word predestined, which I've already covered, praorizo, is he decided upon beforehand that they would be adopted as children of God through faith in Christ and redeemed by Christ. So those whom he set his love on, he foreknew, these also he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So they are predestined to be saved and conformed to the image of Christ. Those whom He predestined, He called. That's the moment of salvation. When we say so-and-so was saved, we're talking about that language that the New Testament says in Romans 8.29 is being called. Those whom He predestined, He called. That's the moment that a person comes to faith in Christ, repents of their sin, places their faith in Christ. And then those whom He called, He justified. That happens at the same time as calling. But justification is the language of being forgiven of sin justified before God, that, that, that your sin is taken away. You place your faith in Christ and God immediately 
imputes the righteousness of Christ to you and your sin, which was paid for by Jesus on the cross, is no longer on your account before God. That is, you are totally forgiven. Your your slate is wiped clean by the blood of Christ. And then lastly, those whom He justified, He glorified. Now glorified is, in the Bible, the language of when we actually get to heaven and receive a glorified body and we never get sick again or or grow old anymore. We have not received that glorification yet. And still the Bible speaks of the glorification of those who were foreknown, predestined, called, and justified, which that applies to us. The Bible says that these also, including us, He glorified. He speaks of our glorification, our eternal inheritance in heaven in the past tense to say, even if you've not received eternal life in heaven yet, even if you've not entered into the kingdom of heaven yet, it's already as good as done. So he uses the past tense. This chain of redemption from foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, glorification is this concept that's being referenced here that God works salvation from eternity past through the end of eternity future. There is no end to eternity future. From eternity past through eternity future, He works the salvation of these people. And so He says in the last sentence in paragraph 6, none but the elect are redeemed by Christ or effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved. Now, we might read that sentence and go, well, that's not fair. But here's the point of that sentence. There is no other way to be saved. You're not getting to heaven by some other means than through the salvation provided by God the Father through His Son and being kept by the power of the Holy Spirit. You will not get to heaven any other way than through this plan of redemption, this plan of salvation which God had from the foundation of the world. Lastly, I'll read paragraph 7 before we get into the Scriptures. And this, honestly, I want you to hear maybe more than any of what they've said thus far in chapter 3. I think paragraph 7 is exceptionally important. It says, The doctrine of the high mystery of predestination is to be handled with special prudence and care so that those heeding the will of God revealed in His Word and obeying Him may be assured of their eternal election by the certainty of their effectual calling. Now let's just break this down. They start by saying the doctrine of the high mystery of predestination. In other words, we don't fully understand this. They just admit that from the start. The Bible tells us these things are true, and we struggle with them. And the authors of the confession are admitting that as they write the sentence. It is a mystery. What is a mystery? Well, they mean by that word, it's something that we don't fully understand. They're confessing that. And so if you're here tonight and you're saying, I'm struggling with this doctrine, I don't know what to think of this, the authors of the confession said the same thing. They themselves said, we we don't fully understand this doctrine of predestination. But the Bible teaches it, so it is true. And then they go on to, to give us some some words of encouragement. This doctrine is to be handled with special prudence. That's a nice way of saying don't beat people over the head with this doctrine. Okay? There has been a lot of fighting among Christians, but in the last decade or two, especially among Baptists, over these doctrines. This is exactly what they're warning us not to do here. Handle this doctrine with special prudence and care. What does that mean? Don't force it down people's throats. Don't uh, don't be arrogant or boastful about it. If you come to this doctrine and you are puffed up with pride, you don't understand what it's really about. Because this truth should humble you, not make you prideful. It should make you realize that the only reason I am saved is because God was merciful to me. I didn't do anything to get myself to heaven. And so what they're doing here is they're saying, first off, it's okay if you don't fully understand. Second off, don't beat people over the head with this. And if someone is struggling with this doctrine, be gracious. And I hope that's how I've come across in teaching chapter 3 to you. Listen, these things are true. The Bible teaches them. 
But that doesn't mean that they aren't difficult truths to wrap our minds and our hearts around. I recognize that. And that is how they wrote paragraph 7. They, they are addressing the kind of tension that we have in reading the previous six paragraphs. They know th that, that those who read this will say, well, yeah, it might be in the Bible, but I don't know what to do with this. Yeah, okay, it's biblical, but what, how do I even understand this? This is, this is hard to, to, just to wrap my mind and my heart around. And they, they say yes. So it must be handled with special prudence and care so that it, it here's what you should take away from this doctrine so that those heeding the will of God revealed in his word. Okay, so this is what God has shown us in the Bible so we know it's true and obeying him so that we may be assured of our eternal election by the certainty of their effectual calling. Why is this doctrine beautiful? Why is it comforting? Because God's sovereignty and salvation teaches you that you didn't get yourself into the kingdom by your works and you will not be kept in the kingdom by your works. Your salvation is of grace. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not of works so that no one may boast. I'm not afraid that I will lose my salvation because I know I'm held by the powerful hand of God. And if God was able to bring me into the kingdom without my help, he's also able to keep me in the kingdom without my help. And so this is a comforting doctrine because I am trusting in his preserving grace, not in my ability to perform, right? Because if I could lose my salvation, I would. But I don't have to worry about losing my salvation because my salvation is preserved and protected by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit working together in perfect unison to redeem my soul and to keep me in the body of Christ and obedient to Him. So, this doctrine, the purpose of it, is to assure us of our eternal election. Like Peter says, make your calling and election sure. So this is biblical language that you need to know that you are one of those whom God has chosen to save. You need to know that you are within the church, that you are among the elect. And I'm not talking about church membership. I'm talking about real salvation. You need to know that you really are in Christ. And then you need to be able to be certain of that by effectual calling. That is, how do you know you're among the elect, those whom God has chosen to save? because you have faith in Christ and you're walking with Christ and you would only have faith in Christ, excuse me, you would only have faith in Christ and walk with Christ if the Holy Spirit of God had changed your heart. You would not be a new person if God had not made you a new person. So the very fact that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come, that New Testament language is the way you know you're in Christ is because the old is gone and the new has come. So how do I know if I'm among the elect? Are you believing in Christ? Are you walking with Christ? Are you a new person in Christ? Has your life been changed by His grace? If the answer to those questions are yes, then, well, there it is. You're saved because of the work of the Spirit of God that is evident in your life and how He has changed you. Lastly, it says in paragraph 7, in this way, this doctrine gives reasons for praise, reverence, and admiration of God, as well as humility, diligence, and rich comfort to all who sincerely obey the gospel. I think this is a wise way of putting it. This doctrine should not cause us to get angry and argue. <laughs> and it's done that for a lot of people. No, this doctrine of God's sovereignty and salvation, it should cause us to praise God. We should reverence Him. We should stand in awe that He has been willing to save even sinners like us. And we should admire what He has done. So that's how we should respond to God. Not by getting angry or rejecting what He has said about how He has saved us. But we should just praise Him and be reverent and admire what He has done. 
And then secondly, what should our personal attitude be? We should be humble. We should be diligent to follow Christ. And then we should take rich comfort in what He has done for us. Why are they wording it this way? Because people back then thought about these doctrines like they do today. It's nothing new. And what they are encouraging us to do here in paragraph 7 is not to get upset or angry over these doctrines. They're clearly taught in the Bible but rather to submit to what the Word of God says and be thankful for how God has saved you. And and even if we can't fully understand it, indeed it is a high mystery, they say. Nonetheless, it is true because it is in the Word of God. It is biblical. And therefore, just because I don't fully understand it doesn't mean that I should not believe it. There comes a point at which I just have to believe what God has told me in His Word and understand that I must not understand all the pieces and the parts if I'm struggling with that doctrine, and that's okay. I will tell you, as I continue to study the Word of God throughout my life, I've come to have great peace with these doctrines. But the truth is, is I have come to that great peace, and I told you two weeks ago when I began this study that I used to hate the doctrines of election and predestination. I I used to, I, I purposely avoided those parts of the Bible. I didn't want to read them. I didn't want to deal with them. I didn't know what it was talking about. All I knew was I didn't like it. (laughs) <laughs> and it was God who humbled me in my early 20s as I studied His Word and I wrote a paper on Ephesians chapter 1 in particular. And since those years, over the past 15 years or so, of continuing to study God's Word and accepting and believing these doctrines, I began to realize this is actually beautiful. This is not something to push against, but something really to embrace. But to be quite honest with you, I, I think it takes being deeply rooted and grounded in Scripture. So here's what I want to do tonight. I'm going to show you three passages, which I believe will show you the beauty of these doctrines in very plain language, and I hope it will encourage you to maybe tonight just just say, you know, these are beautiful truths in God's Word, and and I really should receive and accept what the Word of God says about how God has saved me. So let's look tonight in 2 Timothy chapter 1. This is a passage which you no doubt are familiar with. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And the reason is verse 12. There's a hymn based on this. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to, can you finish it? Keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. All right, that's... See, you memorized the Bible verse singing that hymn and didn't even know it. That's 2 Peter 1, verse 12. We're going to start in verse 8 and go through verse 14. But you're familiar with these passages, whether you realize it or not. 2 Peter 1, beginning in verse 8, Paul writes to Timothy, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, But share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace, which He gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Let me just pause there. Verse 9 is the key. He starts by telling Timothy in verse 8, look, don't be ashamed. You're going to have to suffer for the gospel. But here's why. You should be willing to suffer for the gospel and you shouldn't be ashamed of being a Christian even if you get arrested and beaten and killed for it, which is what happened to the Apostle Paul. He says in verse 9, here's why why you shouldn't be ashamed, Timothy. Because God is the one who saved us and called us to a holy calling. And he did this not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. And so far we might say, well, okay, these are beautiful words and we knew this was true. But then look at the last phrase in verse 9. This grace of salvation that he has given us, he says of this grace, it is the grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. The Greek literally says here, before time eternal. That is before time. Before God created time, 
He gave us the grace of salvation in Christ. How is that even possible? Before he created the heavens and the earth, long before he created you and I, he gave us the grace of salvation through Jesus Christ. How is that possible? Well, it's like Paul says in Romans 8, 29. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. He set his love on us before the ages began, before time eternal. Going on in verse 10, he says, and which now this grace has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. He's talking about his first advent here when he came in the womb of the Virgin Mary and lived a sinless life and was crucified and buried and rose again. That was the first appearing of Christ. And that grace of salvation which he gave us before he created time, that grace has now been manifested through the first coming of Christ who abolished death and life and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what he has entrusted to me. Beautiful words. Paul is a man who's, who's in prison, about to be executed for preaching the gospel. 2 Timothy was the last letter that we have that Paul wrote. And he was about to have his head cut off by the emperor Nero because he wouldn't stop preaching about Jesus. And the only way to make Paul shut up about Jesus is to cut his head off. So that's what was about to happen to the band. And these are some of the last words that Paul wrote before they executed him. And he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, even though they're about to kill me, because I know whom I have believed in. That is Jesus. And I'm convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Paul was absolutely convinced that once they executed him, which happened shortly after he wrote these words, that he would be in the presence of Christ. And he was convinced because God is able to guard Paul's salvation. Notice, Paul's faith is not in himself. He's, he's not saying here, before he knows he's going to be killed, as he writes these words, he doesn't say, I know I'm going to heaven when I die because when I was... So-and-so years old, I asked Jesus into my heart and I was baptized. And by the way, I'm all for asking Jesus to save you and getting baptized. Do you know that? Here's my point. He did not say, I know I'm going to heaven because of what I did. He says, I know I'm going to heaven because of what Jesus has done for me and the fact that he will keep me and guard my salvation until the very end. There's a difference there. I know I'm saved because what Jesus has done for me and will continue to do for me. Now, how do I know that I'm born again? Well, because of the evidence in my life, how he's changed me. So it's not wrong to say that, you know, I asked Jesus to save me and I was baptized. Those are good things. But my point is those things alone do not prove salvation. And my hope of eternal life is not based in what I have done, right? Right? but it's based in what Jesus has done for me. So that when Paul talks about how he can die with confidence, he says, I can die with confidence because I know that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Now verse 13, he tells Timothy, follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me in faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And then look at verse 14. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Timothy, guard the gospel. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Be faithful to the gospel and don't preach anything other than the gospel. But don't do it by your own power. Do it by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. You see? I believe that I will be faithful to Christ because He will keep me faithful. The Holy Spirit will not allow me to stray. 
ultimately, my faith is not in myself, but in God's power and ability to preserve me and keep me. This is so important. Going on to 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Look at how Peter begins the letter. Paul, excuse me, Peter. (laughs) Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, follow the syntax of the sentence here, the structure of the sentence. He said, to those who are elect, and then he names where they're from, and these are regions throughout modern-day Turkey and Greece. And then he says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. You were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. He's using the language of Romans 8.29. Those whom he foreknew... He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. He says here in 1 Peter 1, 2, You are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And once again, foreknowledge does not mean God looked forward into history and passively observed what I would do and therefore chose me. The word foreknowledge means God set His love upon me in eternity past. And because He set His love upon me, He chose to save me. We are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit. Who is it that keeps us saved? The Spirit. For obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with His blood. Did you notice? All three persons of the Trinity mentioned here working together to save us. We saw it in the 2 Timothy chapter 1 passage. Now we see it here in 1 Peter chapter 1. The three persons of the Trinity are working together to save us. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice that language. God has caused us to be born again. Peter is explicitly giving God all the credit for the fact that we are born again. God caused us to be born again. We didn't cause ourselves to be born again, right? He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. He saved you and He's going to keep you and guard you through faith for salvation. So how will your faith be preserved, this faith which saves your soul? Because God is going to guard your faith and keep you in the faith. Lastly, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is a beautiful passage. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I recently preached verses 1 to 12 because it deals with the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, and and all those things. And I dealt with that in eschatology. But after he tells us in verses 1 to 12 of 2 Thessalonians 2 about this horrible persecution of Christians and this man of lawlessness, this antichrist figure who's going to come and persecute believers and all this stuff. Then he gets to verse 13 and he wants to reassure us. He's told us some really frightening things. And then he says in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13, But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the firstfruits to be saved. Now, your translation says this one of two ways, and I'm not sure which is correct. I'm going to just say that right now. I'll explain why there's two ways of translating verse 13, because the translations are kind of evenly split. Your translation either says God chose you as first fruits to be saved or God chose you from the beginning to be saved. Now, both are true biblical concepts. And Paul said both of these things in other places in his letters. I'm not sure which of the two concepts he was communicating here. In the Greek language, the difference is aparkain, first fruits, or aparkes, from the beginning. 
And the difference between first fruits and from the beginning in the Greek language is one letter. And we have, we have manuscripts, copies of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, which have aparkase and some that say aparkane. And it's a one letter difference. And we're not sure which was the original one that Paul wrote. So I'm not even sure which one is correct, but they're both true. And Paul says elsewhere that we were saved as first fruits. And he also says God chose to save us from the beginning. He said one of those two here, they're both biblical concepts. I'm not sure which one he wrote in this particular verse. That's why you'll see a difference. But let's just say it's first fruits or from the beginning. It does not matter because they would both be expressing the same truth. Look at the verse. God chose you as first fruits to be saved. God chose you to be among the first to be saved. These are the first generation of Christians, right? These are the early, early church. And they got to, many of them, maybe not those in Thessalonica, but many of these early Christians got to see the, the risen Jesus or saw him during his earthly ministry. What, what an incredible privilege. Whatever it is, they ought to be thankful that God saved them as first fruits. And the thing about first fruits is, the first fruits of a harvest reveal that more of the harvest is coming, right? The whole point of first fruits is, it's the first of many fruits to come. And so if they are the first fruits, it means that there is a harvest of souls that is following after them, right? There will be many more who will be saved after them. That, that would be the point here. Or he's saying God chose you from the beginning, meaning the beginning of time to be saved. Well, we saw that a moment ago in 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. So maybe he was saying that here as well. Regardless, he's saying God chose you to be saved, either to be first fruits who would produce more Christians, or he chose to save you from the beginning of time. The Bible teaches both. I'm not sure which of those truths Paul was pointing to when he originally wrote verse 13. Anyways, he chose you to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. How does he save you? Sanctifies you by his Spirit and believing, and that is having faith in the truth. So how are you sanctified and believed? Through the Spirit. Not your own work, but the Spirit's work in you, right? That is effectual calling. Verse, 12, verse 14. To this, to what? To this salvation being sanctified and believing the truth. To this he has called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he chose to save you through sanctification and belief in the truth and to this salvation he called you through our gospel and the result of this salvation is so that you will obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, He chose to save you, then He saves you, then He sanctifies you, and He keeps you, and you end up in eternal glory. It's the chain of redemption once again, right? Chose to save you in eternity past, saves you in real time when you come to faith, and keeps you, and you end up in eternal glory in heaven forever with Him. These are beautiful truths. And my desire here tonight is to just help you appreciate them and and even if you're still struggling with this, I would, I would just encourage you, continue reading your Bible. Don't reject something just because it's difficult to understand or challenging. Um, just ask the question, is this, is this what the Bible teaches? And if it is, and I think I've shown you tonight that it is, if this really is the doctrine of Scripture, then we must believe it and we need to try to understand it as best as we are able Understanding that ultimately there are truths in Scripture that we'll never fully grasp until we reach eternity. But nonetheless, the Word of God is true and it is beautiful and it shouldn't cause us to reject or, or, or resist these truths, but rather to praise God and to be thankful for how He has saved us and what He has done for us. That's the purpose of these doctrines. And I pray that that's what God does in your heart. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we, we thank you. We praise you that you saved us, not because of what we have done, but because of your purpose and your mercy and grace in Christ Jesus.
Lord, help us as we submit to your word and continue to study it. Lord, help us to better understand it and to share this gospel with others. In Jesus' name we pray.